Okay, great. Chris, if you want to get started. All right. So, um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me for this. So happy to, uh, talk about some of the, the work I've been doing and, and, uh, just, uh, some of the things that, uh, I see in clinic and, um, Will hopefully be informative. So um, today I'm going to talk about sort of training practices in, in our young climbers and risk for epiphy epiphyseal or growth plate fractures in the fingers. Um, and so just a little introduction. I'm uh, uh, at the University of Washington. I'm a sports medicine doctor there um, and do a little bit of research in, in climbers and we'll touch on some of that today. Um, so We'll just dive right in. So nothing to disclose with uh, this talk. Um, so as uh, a lot of you are aware, I'm sure that uh, you know how popular climbing is and that it is a growing sport. So in the U.S., there's 9 million active climbers. Evidence uh, uh, from insurance waivers suggests that uh, 1,000 to 1,500 uh, new climbers are climbing for the first time every day. Uh, just by comparison, in, in a younger age group, 18 to 24, participation is roughly equal to that of uh, skiing. So this is uh, definitely growing, and um, from sort of a sports medicine perspective, uh, definitely a population that I am starting to see more of in in clinic. Um, particularly of note in, uh, in climbing is that uh, a lot of our climbers are young. So about 40% of active climbers um, are younger than 18. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one, uh, I think it's just that this is a relatively new sport um, or at least newly popular um, and so with gyms cropping up sort of all over the country uh, youth participation has definitely picked up uh, but also in youth youth climbing is a sport where um, uh, young climbers can be elite uh, in sport climbing and so um, some of the uh, best climbing athletes in the world are, are younger uh, young 20s, even late teens, um, in, in some ways somewhat similar to a sport like gymnastics where um, you can be very competitive at a young age. Um, and I think that has driven uh, this growing uh, population in, our, in uh, younger folks. Um, so in general, uh, sport climbing, climbing inside, um, Climbing on walls uh, in gyms is relatively safe, um, but injuries can certainly occur. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have great data on uh, how common injuries are in climbing in general, and especially in younger climbers. Uh, reported injury rates are sort of all over the place. Um, it, you can see there from as little as 0 0.027 to 13 injuries per 1,000 climbing hours. That variability is related to a couple of things. You know, how exactly do you define a climbing injury? Is it just pain, or is it actually an injury that occurs on the wall? Um, and, and also, how do you define climbing hour? It, it, you know, when you are are climbing, a lot of the time is spent potentially just sitting on the mat, or or waiting to climb, or watching. Uh, and do you define injuries by the amount of time spent on the wall, or just sort of at practice or at uh, at the gym? So lack of consensus there, but we do know injuries happen. Um, the rates of chronic injuries in general are, are less known. So a lot of the recorded injuries are for sudden immediate injuries, um, but chronic injuries, uh, just less data on. So when we think about injuries and climbing really falls into two main categories. Um, your acute injuries, uh, which are often from falls, um, and with, with outdoor climbing, uh, certainly you can have uh, catastrophic injuries from major falls, often involving the, the lower extremity. Um, when we think about chronic injuries, that's uh, almost entirely the upper extremity. So uh, certainly fingers and hands, which we'll focus on more so today, but 
uh, even going up the arm, elbows, uh, forearm, wrist, shoulder. Um, and, and these injuries can develop over time. Um, so chronic injuries occurring in the finger and hands, uh, just as highlighting a few things. So certainly uh, tenosynovitis or uh, tendonitis sort of overuse injury of your finger flexor tendons is something we see fairly commonly. Capsulitis or inflammation, irritation of the joints, uh, capsules in the fingers. Um, you can develop stress fractures in the hand and, and fingers. A, a hamate, one of the bones uh, within the, the wrist and hand, is an area that can uh, be affected by a stress fracture. And then what we'll key in on today are these uh, growth plate fractures. So the uh, epiphyseal fractures. And the epiphysis is just sort of the medical term for a growth plate. Um, so what exactly do these uh, look like? So uh, on the left is sort of an, a normal x-ray of a hand here. And um, uh, uh, of an adult hand where you have fusion of the growth plates. Essentially, you don't see them. But in a younger person's hand, like this image on the right, you can clearly see these growth plates at the base of these finger bones all throughout here. And um, uh, why those growth plates exist is so your fingers, uh, those finger bones, have room to grow. And so you continue to grow and then uh, as you uh, enter adulthood, your uh, growth plates fuse and the, the finger bones stop growing. But um, kids uh, will have these growth plates until that fusion occurs. Um, so those growth plates are can be uh, susceptible to injury. Um, and I'll show a picture of a growth plate fracture here. So uh, here you can see a finger, a side view of a finger bone. Uh, and here's the growth plate here, and this little line coming through here is just a fracture right through that growth plate. So uh, uh, we know that in other body parts, the growth plate is uh, susceptible to injury. So, for example, in pitchers, um, you can have uh, shoulder, elbow growth plate injuries um, related to pitching, repetitive throwing. Um, uh, growing pains um, occurring in the knee are related to sort of the traction of the patellar tendon on a growth plate. And uh, so growth plate injuries in general are something that are fairly common in kids uh, that we don't necessarily deal with as, as adults. Um, uh, finger growth plates in most sports are... Um, sort of uh, relatively not thought about, um, but they become very relevant in climbing given the stresses put through uh, the finger joints. And so injury to these finger growth plates uh, definitely occur. Now, what's the problem with these injuries? Well, um, uh, first off, they, they cause pain, they hurt, um, and so it's not fun to have one of these uh, fractures of the growth plate uh, that can uh, limit um, climbing, it can hurt when you climb, um, it causes pain at the finger joints, um, and so it's not necessarily an injury you, you want to have, um, but there's also longer-term consequences um, that um, uh, become sort of more concerning than even just the, the pain that is felt with the injury acutely. So if this isn't uh, diagnosed correctly, uh, if the pain is ignored, if a climber continues to climb despite finger pain and has an underlying stress fracture, this can lead to long-term consequences. So the, the picture shown here is showing a uh, stress fracture um, uh, of the growth plate, which we can see here. But you can see this has caused uh, erosion into the bone here, and cyst formation, and uh, some thinning of the growth plate. Um, and uh, this can result in failure of the growth plate to completely fuse or a malunion of the, the growth plate. Uh, this can result in uh, uh, growth plate closure. So you have closure of that growth plate before the finger is completely fully grown. 
Um, and that can result in, in deformity, that can result in um, uh, arthritis developing in the joint at a very young age. Um, and all of those things can lead to uh, a disability, decreased function, and, and long-term pain. Uh, so that is all not good and, and highlights the importance of making sure we recognize these injuries and, and uh, taking care of them early. So this is an example of how something like this might progress. So uh, the top image there is the finger of a young climber who um, uh, comes into clinic with pain, uh, pain at this joint. And actually that first image is normal. So with this climber, they had an x-ray done because of finger pain, which is the right thing to do. Um, but uh, the imaging looked normal. Um, and so this climber continued to climb, continued to experience pain, and six months later on x-ray, we see this uh, fracture has developed. Um, so at this point, at six months, intervention was taken. The, the climber was advised to completely rest from climbing. Um, and three months later, we see some healing of that uh, growth plate, and by six months after six months of rest, that growth plate is uh, mostly back to normal there. Um, so unfortunately, the only treatment for these growth plate injuries, these fractures, is time. Uh, time and rest. You give, uh, you have to stop the forces that are causing the pain, and that generally means climbing, um, and allow the bone to heal. So this type of injury can can mean a long time off from climbing um, and you know, potentially cause a climber to miss an entire season, six months, um, in some cases longer. The thing is, um, we want to try to catch these injuries before they become full-on fractures. So uh, this climber first presented with finger pain and likely uh, if they had modified their training they had decreased uh, what they were doing. Um, the total time spent climbing or on the wall, they might have been able to prevent progressing to this stage. Um, so anytime a young climber is presenting with finger pain, uh, especially in this joint here, um, you want to take that seriously. You want to uh, address it early on. So how common are these fractures? Well, there's some... Um, there's some literature out there that, that tells us exactly uh, what has been seen, um, but uh, unfortunately, we just don't have a whole lot of data. So this was one study that was done over a three-year period in Germany, um, looking at all climbers coming into a, a specialty clinic. Uh, and they had 911 injuries over the three years in climbers, so a lot of injuries, but the, the vast majority of those were adults. Um, and uh, over that three-year span, they only had about 20 climbers under the age of 15 present to their clinic. However, of those 20 climbers, 16 of them were coming in because they had finger pain. And of those 16, 14 had a growth plate fracture. So nearly 90% of uh, these kids coming into clinic with finger pain ended up having a fracture. Um, so potentially a high percentage of, of kids with, with finger pain. Um, again, we don't have sort of big numbers uh, spanning uh, a, a lot of, of kids, but from what we do see, we... we think that it may be um, more common than we realize. Why do these injuries occur? I, um, what's the mechanism behind it? Uh, you know, I think that's what a lot of us hope to sort of figure out and identify um, so that we can intervene earlier on. One of the main proposed mechanisms uh, that is something that we can control is um, the type of grip used while climbing. A crimp grip, uh, uh, shown in that picture on the left there, puts a tremendous amount of stress through these joints here, the proximal interphalangeal joints, where these stress fractures develop. Um, and so we think that this type of grip 
may contribute to the development of these fractures. We also think that campus board use may be uh, uh, related to these fractures developing. Uh, the reasoning behind that is just because of the board itself, the, the amount of uh, force required um, to climb uh, a board like this it, it is a lot. And so you put a lot of force through those PIP, the proximal interphalangeal joints. Um, and that can potentially over time result in these fractures. So um, other things we think about, certainly training time, uh, you know, is the total amount of time spent climbing, spent on the wall, uh, related to these fractures developing. Um, nutrition, sleep, uh, probably both related as well. We just, uh, we don't necessarily have the hard uh, research to show that, um, but uh, likely there are multiple factors that we should be considering uh, when thinking about prevention of, of this injury. So going back to that, that crimp grip or a grip that might be used on a campus board, you know, what about that grip is, is causing injury to the growth plate? Well, if we look at this diagram um, of sort of how the growth plate sits between the uh, proximal phalanx or the, the sort of first finger bone and middle finger bone, the medial phalanx here, the growth plate is taking uh, a lot of compressive force when this joint is at that 90 degree angle um, as with a crimp grip. So those shearing forces and compressive forces put a lot of strain right through that growth plate. Um, and so if the growth plate is still developing, is not fused, then it results in stress to that bone and over time results in uh, uh, something like a fracture. So um, you know, one thing, uh, one question is well, how aware are climbers of this injury? Um, you know, how, how much do we know about it? And a study actually looked at this recently to uh, which interviewed or, or surveyed a number of young climbers to get a sense of what they knew about these growth plate injuries. Um, and what they found was that just about half of young climbers are completely unaware of this type of injury. So have no um, concept that it is something that can occur um, and is just not something they think about at all. Um, of that group that was sort of totally unaware of this being a potential injury, almost two thirds would participate regularly in things like weighted pull-ups or campus boarding, which again may put them at increased risk for uh, developing this type of injury. Of all the climbers surveyed, only 17% actually recognize that a growth plate injury is a stress fracture. So it is a, a literal fracture to the bone, uh, to the growth plate. Um, and uh, most young climbers are sort of unaware of, uh, of that injury and of the mechanism and what exactly it is. Another question that they asked uh, the young climbers during this survey was uh, sort of about their practices. And, and, and one question was, what is the safe age to start double dyno campus boarding? So this, this of course, is, is using the campus board um, and ascending the campus board with uh, by removing both hands from one rung and then going up to the next rung. Uh, so uh, sort of jumping rung to rung with your hands. Um, and this type of campus boarding um, is, is thought to place a lot of stress on these joints, right? Um, on those finger joints. And so they wanted to get a sense of what climbers thought was a safe age to start using this training modality. And, and what they found is, is most climbers sort of felt that this was okay at younger ages. You know, uh, a good uh, bit saying that age greater than eight, age greater than 10, it was fine to start using this training modality. 
a lot said that, you know, waiting to 13 or even 16 um, would be completely safe. And only a very small minority, sort of less than 10%, felt that it was necessary to wait till age 18 um, or, or later. Um, and so the vast majority of young climbers feel like this is a totally safe um, uh, climbing modality. Um, and I'll get into sort of my general recommendations uh, about this later on. Um, the, the short answer is you know, we aren't totally sure how safe um, this type of training is or not. We don't have firm evidence to say that it is definitely dangerous, um, but we do know there's some risk there. And, and, and so again, I'll touch on that a little bit later. So uh, all of this kind of prompted uh, myself and, and a couple of the people I work with to develop some, some research questions about, you know, what can we look into in the future and, um, what do we need to um, investigate and learn more about? So our first question really was, uh, how are young climbers training? You know, what is out there? What are youth climbers doing? Um, uh, secondly, we would then want to take that and look at um, how are these potential fractures, potential growth plate injuries being monitored? And if they're being diagnosed, how are they being treated? Then we want to start kind of linking the two. Are there training practices that might be leading to these injuries? And sort of the last question is then can we prevent these injuries by chaining, changing training habits? Um, and that's the ultimate goal is we want to provide young climbers with safe training habits that reduce their risk of developing Injury. So uh, the uh, specific aims of, of one of the first studies we we have done is to look at how much are youth climbers training, and to what extent is the campus board being used. So uh, we developed a survey that we sent out to a number of coaches across the United States, over seventy or so coaches. Um, asking them these questions about their climbers, uh, their climbing teams. You know, how much are your climbers training? Uh, are they using the campus board? Um, who is allowed to use the campus board and, and why? Um, and lastly, are you uh, keeping information on your climbers? Are you uh, recording injuries or pain? Uh, what are you keeping track of? Um, what we found is that um, climbers um, on, and these are adolescent climbers on, on climbing teams, are training about a, a, an average of 12 hours a week. And there was a substantial range. Um, you know, we had one coach reporting that their most competitive climbers were climbing up to 25 hours a week, uh, which is a lot. Um, but the median was around 12. Um, the uh, most of these climbers are climbing most of the year. Um, uh, uh, there was a median of eleven months out of the year um, that climbers are climbing. So this is really a year-round sport. Um, we think of two seasons, sort of within climbing, the bouldering season, um, as well as uh, kind of top rope uh, season. But um, that uh, results in climbers. Uh, often climbing all year round. Um, less than 10% of coaches report their climbers climbing less than eight months out of the year. So most climbers are climbing most of the year. Um, and, and then uh, another finding was that uh, about two thirds of climbers only participate in climbing and no other sport. Um, so this is referred to as specialization, meaning that the athlete only competes in one sport and they've given up all other sports or, or they're um, you know, not, not participating anywhere else. Um, regarding campus board use, uh, the majority of coaches we surveyed do use this modality with their climbers. 
And most coaches do recognize an injury risk. And I, I think the vast majority of coaches that we surveyed really are thinking about this in a, in a uh, smart way and are thinking about, you know, how they can reduce injury using the campus board. Um, so, so that was good to see. Um, the, the thing is, there was not necessarily a consensus among coaches about, um, you know, who should use the campus board. So um, a lot of rules were cited as far as um, recommending different ages or ability levels or other factors that, that go into who should use the campus board or not. Um, but this varied greatly from gym to gym. Um, the other thing we found is that the most of the coaches that we surveyed are interested in participating further or happy to um, you know, provide more information or potentially participate in, in other research projects. So this was nice to see as well. Hopefully we'll be able to create um, sort of more data from, from this group of coaches. So, uh, you know, what does all this mean and, and what can we take away? Uh, uh, I, I just want to bring up these recommendations around sports specialization. So, uh, again, specializing in one sport um, is uh, something that a lot of medical sport, sports medical organizations have looked at as being um, a, a uh, something that can potentially uh, lead to injury. Um, so uh, we know that in several sports, um, specializing at a young age increases the risk of injury or uh, extremity pain, also increases the risk of burnout, sort of psychological burnout or dropping out of a sport. Um, and, and so we try to encourage against specializing uh, in one sport, especially at younger ages. Um, studies have looked in, in other sports and professional athletes, you know, professional football players, basketball players, when they were younger, they were more likely to participate in numerous sports or multiple sports in high school before maybe specializing in college. Um, so we think that uh, athletes tend to last longer and uh, perform better if they are competing in multiple sports. Um, so given that uh, you know two thirds of the, the coaches reporting or coaches reporting that two-thirds of their climbers are only climbing is a little bit concerning um we uh, when i see climbers in clinic you know i try to encourage um uh, uh diversifying sort of sport participation so some of the rec these, this is just a list of recommendations that have come uh, from the national athletic trainers association but is uh, sort of seconded by multiple sports medicine organizations um, uh, uh, nationally. And so those recommendations are delay specializing in a single sport as long as possible, as we sort of just discussed. Uh, participate in one team at a time, so don't participate in, in multiple teams during the same season. Um, less than eight months out of the year, adolescent and young athletes should not play a single sport more than eight months per year. So if we go back to the, the information that sort of we gathered in a survey, it's uh, you know, an estimated less than 10% of our climbers um, are following that rule. Um, and uh, now th these recommendations are not necessarily specific to climbing. Uh, they're specific to all youth sports. Um, but uh, I think we should be aware of this uh, very clear guideline that is not being followed by most climbers. Um, next there it says uh, no more hours per week than Asian years. So this is a, a pretty good rule to follow when thinking about how much our young athletes should be training. So uh, a 12-year-old athlete, uh, therefore, should not participate more than 12 hours per week in organized sport. Um, so something like 25 hours a week would be uh, considered too much. Um, the, again, our average was about 12 hours per week um, spent in, in uh, climbing, but there was some range there. Um, two days of rest per week are recommended, so uh, making sure that there's a minimum of two days completely off from climbing per week um, and uh, rest and recovery from organized sport participation. So at the end of a, a 
competitive season, you know, we should be allowing our youth climbers to take a break and rest from that sport and uh, both mentally and physically. The reasons behind these recommendations are to reduce injury, to reduce burnout, to maintain uh, participation. So um, I really do think it's important to keep these guidelines in mind when we think about our climbers. As far as campus board use, we don't have any recommendations to necessarily go off of. And I think that's why there's a lot of variability among climbing gyms, climbing coaches, and, and why um, young climbers don't really uh, know when they should uh, use these training modalities. And, and that's because we just don't have any sort of national recommendations um, or consensus. So the recommendations I'm showing in this table are, are uh, sort of what are basically my recommendations, what um, you know I think is probably best practice. Um, and so I'll highlight a couple of these points. Um, one, that campus board training should in general be de-emphasized as a training board, uh, a training modality in adolescent climbers. And probably most of our adolescent climbers should avoid the campus board entirely. So that means climbers 18 and younger, uh, for the most part, probably shouldn't even be using this training modality. Um, that may seem overly restrictive, um, and, and I admit it, it very well may be. Um, but coming from um, sort of a, a medicine background, uh, you know, my job is to reduce injury, uh, you know, keep keep our athletes as safe as possible. And when we don't have data on something, when we just don't exactly know how um, how campus board could be affecting risk for developing these finger fractures. My uh, opinion is to err more on the side of caution uh, than not. Coaches should continue to promote good climbing form, emphasize shoulder, core engagement uh, during climbing, and I think uh, most coaches are doing this. Um, coaches should monitor for signs of fatigue, encourage rest. Uh, when cl that good climbing form seems to be deteriorating. Coaches should encourage an open hand grip versus a crimp grip whenever possible. Um, and I should mention that's uh, not necessarily just for these growth plate uh, fractures, um, but also pulley injuries, ruptures of the uh, finger pulleys, common injury in, in climbers of all ages um, are much more common with a crimp type grip than an open hand grip. Um, coaches and parents of climbers should monitor climbers growth curve um, so this is a fairly simple intervention where you can monitor uh, how rapidly um, the climber is growing and during growth spurts uh, those growth plates are much more susceptible to injury that's not just in the fingers that's kind of every growth plate in the body and so um, you know I'm very often seeing people with um, growth uh, pain at growth plates like at the knees uh, during these growth spurts. So um, definitely should be extra cautious during that time of um, uh, a growth spurt. Campus board training can be considered um, in uh, a select few of highly experienced adolescent climbers. So, I, you know, I think you can think about this as a training modality. Um, you just have to be sort of cautious and very judicious about its use. And um, one um, recommendation is to uh, confirm that a growth spurt is ended. Um, and so you can do this with an x-ray. You can uh, see a medical provider, but uh, you, I mean, you can x-ray the hand and see if those growth plates have closed. And if they have, well, then the risk of growth plate injury is, is, isn't there. So um, you know, I think confirming that the growth spurt has ended, um, and even better, if you can confirm that the growth plates have fused, um, then you know it's safe. Uh, coach, climber, and parents should all feel comfortable um, with the, the proceeding. Climbers shouldn't have any finger pain. So if there's finger pain, you should stop using the campus board. Um, monitor the climber while they're using the campus board. Um, so the, uh, uh, I think one of the challenges here is that we can tell young climbers to avoid the campus board or use it minimally, but um, a lot of kids may be doing this on their own. 
um, uh, you know, either at home with their own campus board or, uh, you know, at the gym on their own time. And so, um, you want to discourage that and, um, encourage, um, climbers to be monitored while they're using the campus board. So someone can be watching their form and making sure they're doing things correctly. And lastly, just having specific goals in mind. You know, why are you using the campus board? What's the specific thing you're trying to gain, finger strength or otherwise? Um, and just make sure it fits with uh, uh, the goals uh, you have. So some general tips that I, I think can be applied broadly. Um, monitor growth curves. It's fairly easy to do. During growth spurts, uh, there's an increased risk of injury. And just being aware of that, uh, I think, is, is helpful. Pay attention to symptoms. So if a uh, young climber is reporting their finger hurts, you know, take note of that um, and uh, keep an eye on that. If it stays persistent over multiple practices, then that climber needs to, to, to back up. Um, and, and so that's uh, certainly important to just keep an eye on. Um, observe the climber climb as often as possible. Make sure they have good form, that they're not uh, fatiguing. And then monitor for things like overtraining, specialization, and burnout. So, uh, you know, those rules we discussed earlier are pretty um, straightforward and um, much more difficult to actually follow. Um, so our next steps from this point is looking at um, coordinating among coaches and national organizations. You know, we do want to develop consensus guidelines. So uh, I, I think that's one of the next things we're looking at. And then we also want to develop a system where coaches, parents, climbers can easily monitor and record their pain, record injuries, record growth spurts, record the training time, and start building a database that then we can use uh, to um, start getting uh, better evidence on this. Um, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll kind of turn things over. That's the end of my talk here, but um, you know, happy to answer questions and uh, happy to uh, turn it over for, for a little more information. Thanks very much, Dr. McMullen. Um, it's what a great opportunity we have here today to, to share this information or get this information from you and, and share that information out into the climbing community, uh, to the coaches and parents that, that really need it. Um, really appreciate the recommendations. And, uh, with that, I will go ahead and take over the screen share. For sure. Stop that. And uh, pull up my slides. And so to introduce myself, I'm Mitch Owens. And I put this event together today with Dr. McMullen uh, just to try to establish, you know, what are, what are some of the best practices uh, for preventing youth climbing injury? And, you know, his emphasis with his research is, is on finger fracture. And I want to broaden the scope a little bit uh, to include some other serious injuries. Um, so uh, just to create some context here, uh, again, my name is Mitch Owens. I'm a physical therapist from Seattle, Washington. I'm the co-founder of Union Physical Therapy. And uh, we have a small practice here in Seattle that focuses on the treatment of outdoor athletes. And over the last six or seven years, I've been very focused on treating climbing injuries. I've done some research on climbing injuries on a pretty independent basis, nothing, nothing overly uh, sophisticated, but enough to generate some observations and some data that help guide my treatment principles and standards. Um, I work with some youth, youth climbing teams. I work with the Seattle Bouldering Project team. And uh, in addition to that, I work with uh, athletes at various gyms in the region. I treat a lot of route setters. I treat a lot of coaches. Um, and, uh, and I give talks at climbing gyms. Uh, Vertical World is, is the place that I frequent um, to just educate the community about uh, preventing various kinds of climbing injuries. So pretty broad uh, scope of knowledge on climbing injuries and um, you know, a population that I would really like to see injury numbers going down in is youth climbers because, you know, as a youth athlete, you're full of drive, but not always full of information. And, uh, and you're at risk of creating an injury that can affect your function and your performance for the rest of your life. Uh, and often if a coach or a parent can identify that injury early enough, uh, 
then that loss of function or performance through life can be prevented. So that, that's really part of the goal of today's talk and, and uh, the aim um, for uh, getting Dr. McMullen and myself to have this conversation here so we can post some, this information online. Uh, so from there, uh, what do we? What can we do to prevent overuse injuries um, in the in the climbing world? Because obviously there's you know the not so preventable injuries like a slip and fall or um, you know the traumatic injuries that come from peeling off a route. Uh, you can't always prevent those. That's a little more common sense and a little more technique based and judgment based. Uh, but the injuries that are about training volume, we can prevent, right? And so. Um, we want to promote appropriate recovery and rest. I think that's the, one of the hardest things to get into a youth athlete, any youth athlete's mind, mindset or uh, within the mindset of a climber um, is that, you know, you can't just go and work your project every day uh, and expect your body to hold up to it. And, <clears throat> you know, often with the youth climbers that are coming in here for treatment, uh, I'm seeing that they, you know, that they have their, their training schedule that's laid out by their coaches and that it's practical and there's an appropriate rest period built into it. You know, that they're not climbing back to back to back days every day of the week, you know, every month of the year. Uh, but you know, that they're training within those schedules, say it's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday training schedule, but then they're going into the gym on Saturday and Sunday and they're projecting and climbing at the very top of their uh, endurance capabilities um, and power capabilities. And that's where some of these injuries start to pop up. So, uh, you know, with that also avoiding overtraining uh, and then trying to emphasize concepts around cross training. You know, Dr. McMullen mentioned, you know, taking months off in the year as a, as a way to do that, but also selecting other sports that they can play, uh, you know, in those off periods of the year. You know, kind of being more of like a two to a three sport athlete. Uh, so encouraging your climbers to get out and doing doing sports that involve variable loading, like field sports, like ultimate frisbee or soccer, uh, and things of that nature, because that's really going to help kind of build a healthy bone structure um, and also just kind of give their other systems a chance to rest and round out the athlete. Um, in addition to cross training, uh, you know, in from a kind of a broader scope. It's also good to think about training antagonistic muscle structures um, because climbing is fairly one-sided. You know, we're working against gravity to go up, and often the muscles that are involved in that are our muscles that we use for depressing the shoulder girdle and then pulling the shoulder girdle back. So, training muscles that help to press or elevate or decompress the shoulder girdle tend to be very helpful in preventing injury, and then also. Uh, pulling forward exercises tend to be very good uh, in general and just speaking in really broad strokes tend to be very good uh, in preventing injury and so uh, a lot of times people um, think of like dips and push-ups as antagonistic exercises but that's really not true because they're also generally training muscles that depress the shoulder girdle downward. Um, and so I go around in every talk I, I'm giving, whether it's about elbow or hand injuries or shoulder injuries, I always make sure that we're talking about antagonist training. We'll touch on that a little bit later. Uh, the last piece is nutrition. Um, so making sure that athletes are, are getting enough nutrients and the right kind of nutrients involved with their sport. And we can talk on that a little bit later as well. Um, so one thing that we can do as parents and, and coaches uh, is to be able to identify, well, what are the serious injuries that these kids can't climb through anymore? And when we need to say, okay, we need to stop climbing and we need to get you checked out by somebody. So uh, some things to look for, obviously like pains within the joints of the fingers uh, or pain on top of the fingers, which can be uh, indicative of a stress fracture uh, or a pulley injury, which is uh, an injury that if you don't treat it properly, you can it can lead to more and more serious problems. Uh, so that would be identified by uh, a dynamic loading event or a loading event in the hand that's associated with a pop sometimes, not all times, uh, and then uh, the immediate onset of pain on the undersurface of the finger. Uh, and then ultimately, those don't like to be loaded too much during the first couple of days after the injury, uh, but they sometimes will improve rather rapidly and that doesn't mean that the pulley has healed. It just means that you've 
stretch the pulley out to the point where that painful part of the pulley is no longer being loaded. Speaking in general terms, when we're talking about an elbow or a shoulder or even a spine or a knee or a hip or an ankle issue, if we see pain with a loss of strength or pain with a loss of movement or total range of motion so they can only raise their arm up so high, that's a that would be an indication that there has been some kind of a serious injury and that's something you want to get looked at. Um, also, we can look at pain that persists and it doesn't have a nice, you know, consistent arc of recovery. Uh, you know, most soft tissue injuries should heal within six to eight weeks. But if you've got, you know, something that is pretty level over a two to four week period, get it checked out. Uh, pain associated with audible clunking, clicking, or locking up would also be, and what do we mean by locking up? That means like, you know, you maybe get into a certain range of motion and you get a hitch and you maybe have to work it out before it extends all the way. Those would be reasons to, to get checked out as well. And then persistent signs of swelling or inf inflammation. Um, so I like to, when I'm going out and educating folks about injury and how to respond to injury and, and you know, how, how do you decide whether to climb, whether to not climb or whether to see a doctor, I like to do like a red light, yellow light, green light system. I would consider red light signs to be a loss of range of motion or strength, as I just discussed. Guarding postures, so somebody's guarding an extremity after injuring it. Uh, obvious signs of deformity or pain at rest. So pain at rest is something to look for as a red light uh, kind of symptom and it would be an indication that yes, you shouldn't be climbing and you should be on your way to get checked out by uh, a medical doctor or uh, a qualified therapist. Um, as far as yellow lights are concerned, these are situations where you know, you know maybe you can climb still, but you should probably be avoiding climbing or climbing at a very low intensity. Uh, and you should also be seeking care in these yellow light scenarios. Um, so range of motion and strength are intact, but pain worsens over the course of a climbing session. Uh, there's a change in move selection, meaning like maybe you're not going to be doing Gaston's because that's a painful move or underclings are painful uh, and you're just avoiding that motion. So if, you, if you're avoiding certain moves or movements, then you should probably be getting that checked out and probably not climbing hard on it because you're running the risk of a worsening situation. Uh, pain that persists for more than 24 hours after a training session is something to look for as well. It's not unusual to have pain, soreness, stiffness, or a little bit of tendon irritation, joint irritation associated with climbing. That's just part of the sport. But if it lasts for more than 24 hours and you're not recovering from that, then that's a, that's a yellow light scenario that you want to move on and get checked out. Um, pain that fluctuates and again doesn't have that steady arc of recovery would be another thing to check out as well or uh, another reason to give you pause on uh, climbing at your previous level um, and or uh, you know not modifying your climbing. Uh, in these yellow light scenarios you should definitely be dropping down the intensity of what you're doing. Uh, you know it's always good to try to maintain some semblance of, of grip strength and tissue uh, integrity uh, during these times, you know, which in, requires loading, which re requires you to climb, but uh, you should really be considering how much you're doing and or uh, just not climbing at all. Uh, in the green light scenario, so if you've got some pain, but you know it warms up well, so we have a warm up phenomenon and it's generally improving over time and it gets better within 24 hours, you don't have restrictions in move selection, range of motion or strength, that's a green light issue. Climb through it. You know, think about modifying your activity. But if you know uh, this is an issue, you can work through. Continue working through it, and you know, talk to your talk to your coaches and see if you can get some uh, advice on how to train through that. And that might be a, a scenario where you seek out some care as well. Um, so, just talking about pulley anatomy. Why is it such a big deal to climb through a pulley injury? So, the pulley itself. If we're looking here at the slide, you can see that. You know, the long flexor tendon of the finger is going through this uh, fibrous sheath. It's a continuous sheath that has thickenings in some places. And those, those thickenings we call pulleys. And I think of it just like a ligament. So if you, if you sprain this pulley, which is essentially what's happening, you overstretch this pulley because of a dynamic loading event, that thing needs to be protected so that it can heal and shorten up and stiffen up again. Otherwise, you're going to have this loose pulley. And what you end up doing is just advancing 
the the tear up into further pulleys in the hand. So you know, let's say we pull, we sprain the A3 pulley first, then you start working into A2, and you just keep climbing through the pain. Well, you can go up to your A4 pulley, and then that's a situation where you might need surgery. So, uh, Dr. McMullen talked about climbing and hand position and how that influences loading. Um, this diagram always drives that home for me. If we look at an open hand position, which is in this diagram here, and, and then also demonstrated in this diagram here, the force on the pulley is 8.1 newtons. Okay. Now, if we look at a closed crimp position, like this hand is showing us here, you can see that that force on that same pulley goes up to 254 newtons. Now, I'm not a great mathematician, but I know if I'm trying to protect my finger structures, we're going to keep it into the open pulley situation or the open crimp or open hand situation. Um, so, you know, pulley injuries can happen, happen a variety of ways, but it's usually a dynamic loading event where you're dynoing off a crimp. So that would be something maybe to avoid uh, or your feet cut when you're in a crimp. And that that's not, you know, something that you can necessarily avoid in all cases, uh, but you can definitely avoid dynoing off of crimps uh, in training sessions uh, and in competitions if, if there's a workaround. Um, the other thing that I'll see in youth climbers sometimes is if their musculature get in the depressing muscles of the shoulder girdle gets so great uh, is that we can get some peripheral nerve compression. So tingling at nighttime, numbness at nighttime, those kinds of things can be an indication that that's happening. And there are, you know, there are certain risks that come with that. Um, and so peripheral nerve compressions often lead to some of these more serious extremity issues. And that's, that's just a, a teaser there for, for future talks, but you have tingling or numbness, definitely an indication to get some, some uh, care and get that investigated. Um, so in terms of trying to prevent some of these injuries, we really pr go out and promote antagonist training um, and, you know, maintaining flexibility uh, and soft tissue mobility, you know, stretching, rolling, uh, maintaining tissue mobility in that way. And then looking at, you know, some technique and, uh, and then training modality selection, as Dr. McMullen mentioned, with the uh, avoidance of things like uh, weighted hangboard training and then campus boarding. Uh, if you if you haven't finished that growth curve, um, so what are we talking about when we talk about antagonists? So basic, you know, in speaking in very broad terms, you know, basically again they're just muscles that do the opposite of your climbing muscles, and so that would be pressing this direction, pressing up or pulling forward. Uh, but that also uh, exists within core musculature as well. So in this slide, I'm, I demonstrate some of the deep neck muscles, uh, deep neck flexors, uh, and then the uh, flexors of the trunk as well, so abdominals, uh, because climbing does just strengthen everything on the back side of your body. You know, that's true of the rotator cuff too. We want to keep that balanced as well. And so uh, on unionpt.com, you'll see under our specialty programs, we have a program called the Climbers Project or our Climbing Injury Prevention uh, or Climbing Injury Treatment uh, Program. And uh, we've outlined there a number of videos that go through and show you different levels of uh, antagonist and injury prevention exercises that you can check out. Um, you know, this is an, these are some examples of some of the exercises uh, that we recommend. And, you know, for youth athletes, for young athletes, you know, the, the risk of growth plate, plate fractures exists from weight training just, just like it does from, uh, from campus board training. So we have to be really conscious of, to uh, keep weights low Make sure that if a kid is uh, a youth athlete is doing some weight training exercises, that they look like they can do them smoothly and in a controlled fashion, um, and that they're being monitored when they're doing these programs so that they're not uh, goofing around with their buddies and stacking up the weight and, and uh, potentially uh, creating an injury while they're trying to prevent one. The last piece I want to touch on is nutrition. So within the sport of climbing, it helps to be light. And uh, it is something that youth and, you know, adult climbers emulate is a leaned out uh, physique that is efficient for, for going up. And so any sport where, you know, your, your performance improves or there's an aesthetic uh, associated with, uh, you know, being lean in the sport, uh, there's a risk for over dieting and poor nutrition. And so that can create a scenario where we have what 
what's called or referred to as low energy availability. And what happens is when your body has sustained low energy availability, your bone mineral density drops yes. and your risk of a bone stress injury or a bone stress fracture increases significantly. Um, and a sign mm -hmm. of, in female athletes, uh, youth athletes is amenorrhea or, or irregular periods. So if there's any dysfunction in their menstrual cycle, essentially it, it uh, immediately identifies a four to a six time increase in a, in a bone stress injury. So, you know, as coaches, you need to be vigilant and promote proper dieting, proper nutrition. Um, and obviously it's a sport where, you know, being lean improves performance. I was a wrestler growing up, so I know all about dieting as it relates to sport. Um, and you know, we need to, we need to promote healthy habits in that regard. Yes, you want your climbers to be lean, but you do not want them over dieting and getting into a scenario where they're putting themselves at risk of a bone stress injury. So with that, we'll close out the, uh, the, uh, conversation here today. I want to thank everyone uh, who chose to join us and, uh, and I'll look forward Dr. McMullen to, uh, working with you to continue to try to promote, uh, healthy habits and, uh, procedures within the climbing community. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity and, uh, uh, great talking with you today. Yeah, absolutely. Have a good day.